Our first of the four governor candidates we're going to speak with today. I'm joined by the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, and via telephone, Chris Miller. Chris, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, gentlemen. So great to be on. Great to have you with us. It's been uh, great getting to know you over the last several months. Uh, heck, over more than a year now since you began your campaign and toured the state. You've stopped in the studio many times. How are you feeling today? feel like a million bucks, man. And, uh, you know, I'm a boxer, Rob, and that's one thing that uh, fighting prepares you for is to have the mindset of being a champion and getting in uh, the ring and fighting without any fear. And uh, um, I love I love the people of West Virginia and love the experience, and it's going to be an absolute honor to uh, govern as well. So, um, you know, man, this has been one of the most fun things that I've ever been through because you get to travel the entire state, meet so many great people, and that is hands down the best thing about West Virginia. We've got the best people on planet Earth, and it doesn't matter where you go, if it's the southern part of the state or the northern panhandle or where I'm from in Huntington or the eastern panhandle. The people are just fantastic, and we deserve better. We really do, and I want to be able to provide that. What's your gut instinct telling you about how this day will end today for you, Chris? Oh, boy, a million-dollar question. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are surprised, and West Virginians are going to choose a conservative Christian business guy to lead them and guide them, and it'll be an absolute honor. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, good morning, Chris. Again, I want to echo what Rob said. It was a pleasure to get to know you through the last several months. Uh, I enjoyed very much you've been in studio and the exchange we had. So thanks much for sharing with us. Uh, my question would be, uh, and you run a very robust campaign. Is there, looking back at this point in time, is there anything you would have done differently up front than what you, what, than what you did? No, you know, not at all. Um, I've learned a ton as well doing this. There's a, there's an art and a science behind it. And what I wanted to do is just provide people with who I am and be very, very genuine and open and up front. And, and you know, Bill, you and I talked about this before. I talked about my, my sobriety and being sober since April 1st of 2004. I mean, how many, how many people do you know that go out and uh, campaign with, you know, the complete and utter honest truth on stuff like that? It, it doesn't happen often. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't change a single thing. It's been it's been fantastic getting to meet everybody around the state and getting to know you guys as well. I mean, I've said this a bunch. This is the truth. You guys are the um, hands down the most researched, knowledgeable, and informed group of radio hosts that I've ever been you know able to interact with. And it's been an absolute honor getting to know you guys. Chris, you just made the opening promo for the next year and a half on this show. <laughs> At least a year and a half. Let's keep it going forever and ever, Rob. Ride that horse till they put it down. Uh, Mr. Gilstrap. It's the truth, though. I mean, it really is. It's the truth. It, it, you guys are hands down, I mean, hands down, the most researched, knowledgeable group of radio hosts that I've been, uh, you know, privileged to interact with. Thank I you, mean, sir. It's, been, it's been awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll, dialed in, man. I'll join into the Mutual Admiration Society here. You brought a level of energy into the <laughs> studio that we don't often have here, especially from politicians. And, and I know you're not a politician, right? But it's... Um, just kind of a force of nature. You sit down, it's like, wow, holy crap. You know, especially in the morning when you don't have the coffee already yet. So I do have a question for you, though. You know, this is, yeah. it's a long, it's a long slog, this election thing, right? So it's one poll after another. Only one poll actually counts, of course. And, you know, it's, you, you pull close and then they pull away. And that's, my, my question for you is, what, how do you stay not distracted by that? It, is, it, is it something you watch every day, every hour? You've certainly got staff that is telling you how it's going. Or do you just put it away and not think about it and just keep focused on the next day? Well, um, if you remember, I'm a bit of a data guy, and that's what led me into doing this thing at the very beginning is that I started a data company. Just curious to see what was going to happen during and after the pandemic and learned a ton about the movement that's happening in our country. But using that same approach and that same understanding, you know, we were tracking it every single, every single month for 16 months and then every single day for a couple of weeks. And, you know, there's a difference between public polls and real good, solid data. And, you know, so been watching that and we know the people in West Virginia are looking for something different. They're looking for a conservative Christian business guy. They're looking for somebody to speak their mind, to tell them the truth. And that's what we've done the entire campaign. Um, and the thing that I love the most about all this, by the way, is that elections are never, ever, 
ever about the political class. They are always about the people. And when you know what the people in West Virginia are looking for and you are you literally line up with that and you you talk to them in an open and honest way and in a very genuine way. People are dying for authenticity, and that's what I tried to bring to the table. And I just got a funny feeling that the uh, voters are going to are gonna go with us at the end of the day because, man, I'm going to give it everything I got. You, you mentioned earlier the, uh, the energy thing. I've had that my entire life. It's just something that uh, – I was gifted with. I was gifted with high energy, and I feel sorry for my wife sometimes for having to live with me because I think it might be like a hurricane at times. But it it it, it lets me be very very productive, and it, it it's how we built all the businesses that I've got is believing in people and leading them and motivating them and inspiring them and helping bring the most out of them that that I can, and that that's that's just a, a, a it's a skill that I've developed over a period of time, and and I want to translate that into leading West Virginia into the absolute like greatest comeback story that's ever been written. Chris, and I think we can do this. Hey, let's talk about uh, for the people who haven't voted yet. Your first week in office, your first month in office. You mentioned some of this in one of your ads. What's the Miller plan? First day you become governor. This is so simple, and people love it. Day one, we're going to audit every single dime. Every single one, we're going to find the $300 hammers, and we're going to find the pieces of equipment that disappeared out of the back of the Department of Highways. We are going to find everything. Day one, audit every dime. Day two, we're going to drug test for welfare. And that does a couple of things, because if you're using drugs and you've got a problem, you need help. But then you know darn well that that, those resources are not going to the kids. And so it allows us to identify who needs help and also redirect resources to kids. And also, man, I don't want my tax dollars to go to make drug dealers rich. So it's a win-win. And then day three, we're going to put all the legislators in a room without lobbyists and without special interest, and we're going to come up with the plan to get rid of the income tax. And that is what's going to be the beginning stages of West Virginia just taking off. Day one, audit every dime. Day two, drug test for welfare. Day three, get rid of the income tax. And West Virginia will take off right after that. Bill? Yeah. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, uh, more of a comment than a question. Uh, You ran a lot of negative ads. Uh, So did a couple of others, especially uh, uh, Patrick Marcy. Uh, I give you credit, though. You took ownership of the negative ads. You did not hide behind a pack. And I appreciate the fact that you were honest and upfront on who the author of the negative ads. You know, I'm a a fighter. I'm a boxer. And when you get hit, you got to hit back. And when you hit back, you might as well hit back with the truth and put your name on it and tell everybody what in the world you're seeing and what the facts are. And so we literally just went straight forward with the facts and presented the facts and provided them to the voter. And when you do that, things just work out best. John. Chris, I want to drill down into your second day when you're uh, drug testing uh, for uh, the welfare recipients. Are you suggesting that the welfare recipients who are addicted to drugs, who are using drugs, are going to lose their welfare benefits? The benefits need to go to the kids. That's where they need to go. So it allows us to direct the resources to the kids. Well, you can't give a check to a six-year-old. No, but there's ways. There's custodial ways to do that temporarily while you're helping people. So when I don't, I don't, I don't think our tax dollars should go to make drug dealers rich. I just don't, I don't see that. I think it's a bad deal. But isn't there a cycle in there? I mean, where the, the, the fact that people are using drugs and let's take the innocent drug dealer or drug user as opposed to the you know what i mean there's people are, use drugs for not because they're miscreants but be, for the however people get involved with drugs and the reason they are on welfare is because they can't hold a job because they're taking drugs and and, and they have kids that they got to take care of so th- there's the cycle there if you just stop funding their lifestyle don't we now create a homeless problem and, and such how do we deal with that what's what's the entire plan i guess we aren't doing that. We are not going to do that. We're going to make sure that that person gets help and the kids are taken care of with that money. So there's no cutting it off. It's making sure that we're able to identify who needs help. There's not a person that has a job around West Virginia that isn't susceptible to drug testing. It's a part of, like, you have to have sober people to work. So why in the world would you not want sober people who, who, who are, are not working? 
And so it allows you to identify who needs help and get them the help that they need and make sure the kids are taken care of because that is the big crime. The biggest crime is if you are on welfare and you are using drugs and you have kids, those kids are not being taken care of. We got 7,000 kids in our foster care system right now, 7,000. And it's almost three times as much as it ever has been. That is an incredible burden. And we've got to make sure and get all these kids help. We're still at the tail end of big pharma poisoning us. And now we've got open borders and the fentanyl thing happening. Like, we have to get people help. And the long-term data tells us very, very specifically that if you go into rehabilitation, it doesn't matter if you were forced there or you went voluntarily and you complete the entire program, your likelihood of relapse is the same. And so knowing those numbers and knowing those odds, it is absolutely the right thing to do is to make sure and get everybody the help that they need. And also, listen, speaking of the help that everybody needs, we're still dealing with a bunch of inflation out there as well. The average working person is struggling, and it's all about the cost of a gallon of gas and the cost of a gallon of milk. And this is where West Virginia's real big promise and potential comes in. We have what everybody around the country needs, and that's the ability to produce an incredible amount of energy, especially with the rise up of artificial intelligence and the blockchain. And West Virginia has coal and natural gas and rare earth elements, more water than any other state in the country. And the Department of Energy says that we are the, the hotbed for geothermal power creation. We can produce more power through geothermal than Saudi Arabia can generate and be to use a natural gas. When you add all that stuff up, we can dramatically drive down the cost of power for our people up to 70 percent. And that will drive in business and growth and commerce. And also, you think about Jim and Susie Adkins, both of them are on Social Security and they're 70 years old. You cut their power bill by 70 percent. You've done something incredibly impactful for their lives as well. And you add that up with the zero state income tax, West Virginia is going to take off. And the economic growth and development that is really, really essential for our future is what's going to help us solve a lot of these problems, including education. Right there in Berkeley County, there's a major teacher shortage. All the teachers go across to Maryland and to D.C. That literally creates a major problem. And we have to be able to make sure and provide education for our kids. The way to do all this stuff and the way to solve everything at the end of the day is with economic growth and development. We have to create an economy that thrives to keep our kids here because West Virginia's greatest export right now is not its coal or its natural gas. It's its kids. And at the end of the day, we all know this. We are tired of politicians and bureaucrats and attorneys running things because they just say all kinds of words and don't do anything. And that's the difference between me and everybody else is that I'm a business guy. I cut my teeth in business. It's how I've made a living, and I've grown a bunch of businesses. And I say what I mean, and I do what I say. And people are looking for a lot more of that. So, yeah, there's a lot of challenges that we face, but we have to fix them. We have to fix them together. Chris, you've got 60 seconds to convince those who have not yet voted today to vote for you for governor. Go. Well, it's been the honor of my lifetime to run, and if we want the same old, same old, nothing's going to change. If you want to do something different, you want to do something spectacular, and you want to do something outside of the box, and you want to make West Virginia thrive, there's no one else better than the business guy. President Trump did a fantastic job in D.C. when we elected a business guy. Same thing in West Virginia. When you elect a business guy that knows how to get stuff done, knows how to take risks, understands job growth and job creation, and understands how to drive an economy, that's when we win. And I cannot wait to take off and help West Virginia succeed and be a part of writing the greatest comeback story in the history of our country. And we can do it. We just got to do it together. Chris, it was great getting to know you over this last year or so. I wish you the best of luck in your campaign to become the next governor of West Virginia. Gentlemen, it's been an absolute honor, and something tells you this isn't the last time we're talking either. God bless, brother. Have a great day today. You take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris. God bless you guys. Talk soon.